and great for me to be back here. I got my start here in this room. I was an intellectual vagabond wandering around in the street, and Joan took me in very nicely and, and uh, sort of like an orphan. And uh, I've spent many hours in, in that seat there learning, cutting my eye teeth in evolution psychology. So it's, I'm very, very happy to be back here uh, talking today about uh, why we're so odd. Two big questions I'm going to want to talk about today. Um, what are the fundamental differences between human and non-human cognition? And why is there such an enormous uh, gap between us and, and every other animal on the planet? And I'm just going to warn you right up front, I don't have anywhere near definitive answers to either one of those questions. That's not what I'm going to be trying to do. What I am going to be trying to do is talk a little bit about ideas and thoughts I have about answers that aren't plausible answers that might be more plausible than others, and maybe where we should be looking to answers to these questions. Because I really do think that these are two of the most exciting, interesting questions in cognitive science. Um, so I think they're well worth the effort, even though they may be, seem intractable at times, even though we don't seem to be making a lot of progress uh, getting to those answers. My whole talk, then, is based on the assumption that we are, in fact, pretty odd. And I think that's a pretty safe assumption. But just in case any of you have been spending too much time watching National Geographic specials late at night, let me just remind you how odd we really are. There are a lot of animals that use tools to get food and to process the food in interesting ways. But we are, as far as I know, the only animal that has cooking shows. There are a lot of animals that have dominance conflicts between rival males in all sorts of spectacular fashions. We are the only ones, I think, that make that into a spectator sport and bring the kids and our digital camera to do that with. There are lots of cases of grooming and all sorts of interesting altruistic possibilities going on there. We're the only ones that groom this way. Lots of animals build things, but they don't build what we build, do they? We build really, really fancy things, and then we blow it all up. So I think that's my entire case for the fact that we're odd. Let's just assume and stipulate as a, an opening uh, statement. There's a big gap between what human beings are doing on this planet with their brains and their minds and what all the other animals are doing. And that gap is pretty big, actually still immense, a little bit smaller, but still immense, even if you take a look at cultures that are pre-modern or ancestral or whatever term you want to use for cultures that haven't been warped by TV and, and, and professional hockey. I think this guy here probably characterized that gap most accurately um, a long, long time ago now. And let me read this whole text because I think it's very important. No doubt the difference, this is Darwin speaking of course, is enormous even if we compare the mind of one of the lowest savages who has no words to express any number higher than four and who uses hardly any abstract terms for common objects with that of the most highly organized ape. The difference would no doubt still remain immense even if one of the higher apes had been improved or civilized as much as a dog has been in comparison with its parent form, the wolf or jackal. That's from the Descent of Man. And that's what I'm going to call Darwin's tendentious, perhaps even dangerous claim. The gap between human and non-human minds is enormous and it's not solely the result of culture and language. Now I realize there's something ironic about calling that Darwin's tendentious claim because that's what not what most people think of as Darwin's uh, controversial claim. For his 19th century readers, that first claim was not controversial at all. This was the controversial claim for 19th century readers, right? And this is the one we still hear all the time. But that's not a very controversial claim today, at least in this kind of audience or among scientists. This, on the other hand, is an extremely controversial claim today. And that's the claim I'm going to be talking about today, this claim of Darwin's. Because if you look at what comparative psychologists are doing out there, and if you look at least the ones that write best-selling books, they're going in exactly the opposite direction of what Darwin was claiming there. The bookshelves are full of these books, right? I'm not, not making this up. And indeed, it's not just popular books. It's even the scientific journals. And I'm afraid to say that if there were a Martian biologist that was trying to understand the nature of intelligent life on this planet, and his only source of information was the journal Current Biology, he would form, I think, a rather unrealistic view of what's going on on our planet. Let me give you an example. Not too, many, not too long ago, this is Current Biology, an article by Jill Pruitts on the spear-wielding, spear-manufacturing talents of some chimps and fungoli. This was a very, very widely read, widely cited article claiming to find evidence of spear-wielding and spear-manufacture in fungoli chimps. The actual results, when it gets right down to it, is that Pruitts observed, Pruitts and her team observed 22 cases of chimps poking a stick once it's been stripped of leaves and twigs into a log. They saw one case of a chimp eating a bush baby. It's a little Furby-like thing. Eating one case of, a, of, a, of a, eating a bush baby shortly after poking, and they saw zero cases of a stick actually skewering, piercing, stabbing, killing a bush baby. 
That didn't stop the claims from spreading all over the press. <laughs> New scientists said spear-wielding chimps snack on skewered bush babies. Nova called it, they did a whole special on this, how long until they fire up the barbecue. National Geographic had a special called Almost Human in which they said this is a revelation that destroys yet another cherished notion of human uniqueness. And Jill herself, the lead author, said in an interview, back to the drawing board in terms of trying to define how humans are special. So that is the backdrop against which I'm going to be talking today about Darwin's claim that there is in fact an enormous gap between humans and animals. The dominant consensus in comparative psychology today is that there's a continuum between humans and non-humans. That we are smarter, but it's sort of a big, long ramp, and parrots are pretty close to being like toddlers. There's some comparative psychologists, some very well-known ones, some prominent ones, that say there's no gap at all. I write best-selling books to prove that. William McGrew is one of the leading prominent experts on technology or tool use in chimpanzees. He claims that, in fact, there's not much gap between what hunting-gathering tribes do with technology and what chimps do with technology. And those might be not the majority case, but I think this does represent not just a majority case in comparative psychology, but a very prominent and also, to be honest, a plausible hypothesis about the gap. And that gap, and that hypothesis is that the gap between humans and animals is largely due to social cognition and cultural achievements and cultural ratchet effects and those of that nature. Uh, Michael Thomas Hill is one of many prominent uh, researchers that have, uh, have proposed that. I think he's probably the most uh, stark in his terms and how he lays it out. So let me read this to you. Uh, he's, uh, he's claiming here, many different studies suggest that non-human great apes understand the physical world in basically the same way as humans. What most clearly distinguishes human cognition, therefore, from that of other primates is their adaptations for functioning in cultural groups. He calls that the cultural intelligence hypothesis. It's a very well-known hypothesis if you're not familiar with it, and it has a lot of very strong support from very respected, prominent researchers. So the consensus view in short out there is that animals understand the physical world in basically the same way as humans, and the gap, if there is one at all, is social. So let's re-examine the evidence. Let's actually look at what, we, what we're talking about here. Let's go back to the beginning of scientific investigations of animal tool use. The, probably the first guy that did this in a systematic fashion and really tried to understand what chimps were, or non-human animals were capable of tool use was Wolfgang Kohler. Uh, he did a series of very famous experience, uh, experiments with his chimps in Tenerife during World War I. Uh, wrote a book that's uh, quite a classic in comparative psychology and that picture is uh, usually figures prominently in most introductory psychology textbooks. And it's usually cited as an example of insight learning because uh, Wolfgang Kohler's chimps did in fact learn eventually to do things like get bananas with sticks and open things and close things and stuff like that. And they had this sort of arc to the learning curve that, that was impressive and so he called that insight learning. That's what often gets cited in textbooks. What doesn't get mentioned is you take this picture as an example, which is one of the most widely publicized pictures in computer psychology. What doesn't get mentioned in the textbooks is that it actually took Kohler's chimps hundreds of trials to get to the point where they were able to stack these boxes. And even once they got a few successful trials, they hadn't learned the general principles that would cause boxes to be stably balanced on top of each other. And so for years afterwards, they would continue to balance boxes in ridiculous ways, sort of like on the corner, with, with, with three-fourths of the box off the edge. Uh, they would try to stand on them even if the thing was, whole, was complete teetering. They hadn't learned what, was the, the, what were the causal conditions of a balanced tower of boxes. What they simply learned was how to repeat a se series of steps, and sometimes they succeeded and sometimes they didn't. Kohler himself was much less optimistic about what his chimps were doing than most textbooks. Kohler himself had a very interesting phrase, uh, interpretation of it. He said, if you did not know that animals, if you did not know that the animals see perfectly well, you might believe that they were watching extremely, you were watching extremely weak-sighted creatures. Now, of course, Kohler's knows very well that chimpanzees don't have a vision problem. He's not talking about their inability to see the boxes or see what's in the world. But he is talking about something that everybody, I think, can notice if you watch chimps use tools. And that is, they're not seeing something. They're not seeing what we see about what is important about a given physical problem. In the balancing case, they're not seeing that you can't balance a box if most of the box is hanging off the edge. They don't see that because that, in some sense, is unobservable. It has to do with causal principles of physical mechanisms that you can't easily just look at in the physical world. And, and, Kohler, and the chimps aren't seeing that. Fast forwarding to the, the last couple of decades, uh, we've had, we have enormous amounts of evidence now that chimps and many other animals are quite good at using sticks to retrieve rewards, both in the wild and in the lab. There's no doubt about that. There is a classic experiment that Wieselberger, Elisabetta Wieselberger in Italy did um, a couple of decades ago now, uh, in which she added a little trap, a little box here, 
to the classic tube task of pushing food out of the tube. So what looks like a very simple addition to a very easy task turned out, surprisingly, to be extremely hard for the animals to solve. All they had to do was push the food away from the trap. Right? This doesn't seem like it should be that hard. There's only two possibilities. All these animals are w smart enough to figure out how to solve uh, something that only has two possibilities. And yet, and yet, it took, their, it took her capturing monkeys 120 trials to master those two tasks, that, that the trap two tasks. Only one of the four monkeys actually ever learned to consistently push the food away from the trap hole. And then, and this is the big moment, this is the moment where you, we, we, she reveals everything, she turned the whole tube upside down, so that in fact the trap was up and there was no point pushing away from the food, and that capuchin mon monkey kept pushing the food away from the hole. So that really suggests that what the capuchin monkey had learned there was not something about why food falls into holes or why you need to avoid the hole, but just that push the food thing away from that trap hole thing, regardless of where it is. Uh, Danny Povinelli replicated those experiments with chimps uh, back in the late 90s and had pretty much the same results. After 100 trials, only one of his chimps out of the seven solved the task. And when he rotated the tube, the little trap upwards, uh, Megan also did exactly the same thing as the capuchins. She just kept pushing it away from the hole, even when Danny made it really hard for Megan to do that, like putting the stick on the other side and making it really inconvenient. Now that's not an anomaly, because that experiment has gone challenge has, has, had, has uh, garnered dozens of challenges, replications, variations with a number of different species from a lot of researchers who didn't want those results to be true, quite frankly. So this is, this is good science here, right? You, you put up a provocative experiment and then a bunch of other scientists go out there and try to prove you're wrong. Well, guess what happened? Basically, they came to the same conclusion. It turns out that if you give a chimp or a capuchin a table version of the task rather than the tube task, so there's nothing covering it, they learn a lot faster. But then when you get to the crucial transfer test, the control test, they make the same mistake. They don't transfer that to a new table and they don't transfer it to a new hole. It turns out that pulling is easier, easier for chimps than pushing. This was an interesting thing. So it turns out that if you give the chimp the tube and they pull the food towards them, they're much quicker to realize they should pull it away from the hole. But the fascinating thing is when you give those same chimps, once they've solved that task, a task where they have to push, they're back to zero. They haven't learned anything about why they need to pull that food away from the hole. It turns out that if you don't use a stick at all, you just use a finger, the chimps in the, uh, are a lot faster at solving the problem, but they still don't do any better at any of the transfer control tasks. And, and recently, Amanda Seed in Nikki Clayton's lab at Cambridge did some great experiments with actually a much better tube tru task than anyone else had ever done with rooks, who are corvids, right? And corvids are very smart tool users. Now, it turns out, I love this part, it's very ironic, that corvids, rooks in particular, learn the, the trap tube task, the tube task, a lot faster than chimps do. So we can almost say they're smarter. That would be a cute thing to conclude. But the really fascinating thing is that when you give them that control task, they fail also. So she had one rook out of her first seven that, that succeeded in that task. She replicated the experiment with eight other rooks and none of them passed the control. So we don't have samples from every species on the planet, but what we're looking at so far looks like a pretty solid pattern that gets replicated pretty consistently no matter how you keep changing up that experiment. And so that leads, if you will, to my sort of first uh, proposition, or my first fundamental uh, hypothesis, and that is that the difference between human and non-human cognition, at least one of them, is that animals are learning and reasoning about perceptual relationships in the world, that contact, pushing food away from trap-like things, aligning edges of boxes, but they aren't learning about the higher order unobservable principles or causal mechanisms that apply across tasks, things like weight, gravity, rigidity, those, those, those kinds of things. And my hypothesis uh, is that one reason that they're unable to do that is that they're lacking the ability to reason by analogy. And that's a hypo hypothesis that uh, Danny Povinelli and I submitted back in 2007. So that's, that's a, a, a hypothesis, if you will, about what's going on, why those animals are limited in that way. We were, of course, challenged a number of times. Uh, and I'm happy to say that our colleagues in Leipzig, that's uh, Josep Kahl and his crew, uh, after replicating many, many experiments, came to essentially the same conclusion, which is that apes may possess some specific causal knowledge but lack the ability to establish analogical relations between functionally equivalent tasks. And just if you don't know this, you should know that Josip Kahl in Leipzig is part of Michael Tomasello's team over there, and that will be important later on when we talk about the cultural intelligence hypothesis. But that's not all. That's not the only difference. A lot of developmental psychologists Mm -hmm. Does that just limit the structure that they go back to 50% on each side? Exactly. 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 
So development psychologists, a lot of them, have been talking uh, about how children are quite clever at experimenting with the world and acting like little scientists. Uh, I think Alison Gopnik was the one that deserves credit for coining that, that phrase of little scientists. Um, personally, I think that Laura Schultz's work at MIT is fantastic. Every one of her papers is sort of like a, a little joy. Uh, I love how she's discovered, has shown, that preschoolers play the, the most innocent, unstructured thing you can possibly imagine if you have a preschooler. I do. It actually is secretly sort of an experimental little intervention, right? That she's shown that when they go and play with toys, they don't understand how they work. They're actually manipulating the tools on the toys or the, the levers in order to deconfound the possible causal structure of the toy. It's quite fascinating, right? So I'm not going to go through that. That's not the subject of my talk. But if you haven't read Laura Schultz's papers, I'm trying to sell you on the idea of doing that. So I think little preschoolers, humans, are like little scientists. I think that's a nice little phrase for describing what children do. So it's a fair question then to ask, is that true of other animals? Do chimps, for example, ever seek explanations? There has been surprisingly little work done on this. So I don't have a whole lot of experimental evidence to point to. One of the uh, sole cases is Danny did an experiment back in the early uh, 2000s uh, with his chimps and, and a bunch of children. And he gave them a blocks to stand up on their edges. So they're sort of like L-shaped blocks. And to get the food, you had to make the blocks stand up in an upright L. The children and the chimps had no problem learning this task and no problem getting the food or the, the, star, the star stickers when, they, when he first gave them the task. And then what Danny did was he surreptitiously introduced some trick blocks that were weighted so that there's no possible way the thing was going to stand up <coughs> vertically. Okay? But they looked exactly alike. And there, the difference between the species was dramatic. The little preschoolers immediately complained. They looked at the block, they banged the block on the table, they asked the teacher or the, the, the researcher questions, they were just frustrated, and, and they were sure something was wrong. Okay. What did the chimps do? The chimps just, just kept trying to stand the block up over and over and over again. The only chimp that did anything, that looked at the block and tried to inspect it anyway, put the block in her mouth. Right. This is not knockdown evidence there's no such thing as, as science in a chimp, but it suggests that there's something not happening in the chimp mind when, there's, when they're confronted by anomalous events in the world. Back in 97, Thomas Ellen Call, when they wrote their big book on primate cognition, hypothesized that chimps were, would be unable to intervene creatively in relationships that they just saw. And the example they used is that if, they, if a chimp saw the wind blow a tree limb and saw that the tree limb shake, and then the shaking of the tree limb caused fruit to fall, they hypothesized that no chimp would ever run up there and figure that they could pull the vine as an alternative means of getting the limb to shake to get the fruit. Okay? I actually think they're absolutely right. I think they're right, and I think they're right when they said that, that most primatologists would be shocked if they ever saw uh, a monkey or an ape uh, do something like that. That's very interesting if you think about it. It's pretty obvious to do for a human being, for a preschooler, it's pretty obvious that you can intervene in the world in sort of creative fashions like this, and that that seems to be something that we've never had any evidence of in a non-human animal. Um, I think one of the most interesting experiments in this direction was done by my friend right here in this room, Aaron Blaisdell, which I'm going to talk about now, on to what extent do animals understand causal structures. So just a little bit about causal structures. Uh, the world is full of causal structures. Here's a silly one. When it rains, my front yard gets wet, my backyard gets wet. That's what they would call a causal base net. People would call a common cause structure. That is, rain is the common cause of both front yard being wet and backyard being wet. A causal chain would be something like I, the sun goes up, it hits my light-sensitive sprinkler, the sprinkler goes off, it causes the front yard to be wet. So a causal chain, right? There's some interesting differences about this, which will all be intuitive to you, to you, to you as human beings right away. If I do something to intervene, to, to manually cause the backyard to be wet, so for example, I take my hose out and I water the backyard, I'm not going to infer from making that action that the front yard is therefore wet. On the other hand, if I just walk out in the morning one morning and I see my backyard is wet, I'm it may be a fair guess for me to infer that the front yard is also wet because rain, rain is the likely cause. So there's two different inferences I can make depending on whether I intervened on one of those nodes or whether it's, I'm just observing what's happening. And Aaron had the brilliant idea of testing to see whether, whether and non-human animals would also be sensitive to those kind of differences in causal structures between in, intervening and, and observing. And by the way, I'd be saying all these nice things about him even if he weren't here. This is not a sad option. So what he did, what Aaron did, <laughs> what he did was he gave rats a common cause structure and a causal chain structure. And the common cause structure, light, was the common cue for both the tone going off and for food appearing. And in the causal chain structure, light was the cue that causes tone to go off and tone, tone was followed by food. Now there's all sorts of details about how they set that up that I'm not going to go into unless somebody asks me later at the end of the talk. But basically this is the two structures that the rats were given much like the examples I gave previously. And then Aaron gave 
different groups of these rats. The wonderful thing about experimenting with rats is they have lots of them. It's not like chimps. So he had different groups. It's, it's very, very jealous of this. Some of the rats got a chance to push a lever and cause tone to occur. And some of them got a chance to push a lever and cause tone to occur in the causal chain model. Right? So the question is, how would the four groups of rats act? One group of rats are going to just watch tone occur. And will they therefore infer that food occurred? Another group of rats is going to press the lever and cause tone to occur. Are they going to equally infer that food is there? Another group of rats is going to watch tone occur here in the causal chain group. And another group is going to intervene on tone and see if they look for food. Right? And by the way, in case it's not obvious, this would be something, if it turned out to, be, to happen, would really challenge any associative explanation of what's going on in rats' heads. Right? There's no good old-fashioned associative explanation for this. And lo and behold, Aaron's rats did do exactly that. It turns out that when the rats were observing tone, they nose poked much more frequently in the common cause uh, model than they did when they intervened to cause the tone. And in the causal chain, there's no significant difference. So I think the first thing to notice is that this is really a fascinating example, a fascinating evidence. And the only evidence I know of today, because I, I haven't got him to do this for chimps yet, that um, the animals are sensitive to causal structure. And that any associative theory that doesn't handle that is simply not they're dead, dead in the water. Animals are sensitive to causal structure, and they're reacting differently depending on whether they're intervening or they're observing. But for the sake of today's talk, I want to also emphasize something different, which is what the rats didn't do. So it turns out that in the observe case, the common cause condition, where they were just observing, the rats saw a tone, they went to go look for food, but they actually didn't see the light. The light didn't occur. Okay. Now that's a fascinating thing. That's a fascinating thing because I think that a human being would say, well, if I observe tone but the light didn't go off, then in fact that common cause structure that I was always learning, that ain't the thing that's relevant right now, so all bets are off on whether there's food or not. But they didn't do that. Now, I think Aaron and I slightly disagree about why they didn't do that, but the point is they didn't do that. Right? And so that's a very interesting, a very interesting um, behavior or lack of behavior because I think it suggests something that goes back to what Michael Thomas Helen Call's hypothesis was and about what, what Danny found with the Bach experiment, and what we find in general in, human, in, in chimp experiments, is that we're not finding any evidence that the animals are reasoning in a diagnostic fashion. We see lots of evidence they're very smart about reasoning from a cause to the effect, when the causal error goes that direction. We're seeing no evidence that given an effect, they're backing up that causal relationship and figuring <coughs> out what the cause was. So that's a very important difference, and it's very important that you understand I'm not claiming that animals are associative animals, associative learning. I'm claiming something very different. Animals are perfectly capable of understanding causal structures in the forward direction. They don't seem to be doing it in the backward direction, in the diagnostic direction. In short, to turn this into a cartoon, I don't think they're doing this. We're never going to find a rat pushing a lever and watching to see what happens to the postgraduate above them. More seriously, Think about all the ways in which we use interventions as human beings for epistemic purposes, that is, for finding out about the world. And think back to Laura Schultz's experiments with preschoolers. We use it to disambiguate causal structures. We use it to probe for hidden causes. We use it to hold alternative causes constant, et cetera, et cetera. Preschoolers do all those things. There is, as far as I know, no evidence that any non-human animal does any of those things. In short, only one of these creatures is going to be a little scientist. And I think that's a pretty fundamental difference between non-human and non-human causal cognition. So let's go back and think now, review Thomas Ellis' claim. You can read the, the, the part that's highlighted there in yellow, if you can read, I'll, I'll read it to you actually. So contradicting the hypothesis that humans simply have more general intelligence, we found that the children and chimpanzees had very similar cognitive skills for dealing with the physical world, but that the children had more sophisticated cognitive skills than either of the ape species for dealing with the social world. I should, I should explain actually. This, come, this paper comes from an article in Science, it comes from a, a massive experiment that they did uh, involving uh, like a hundred, exact number is like 106 chimpanzees, 32 orangutans, and 105 human children. As far as I know, this is the biggest comparative psychology experiment ever in the history of comparative psychology. Um, and it was published in Science. It's a huge paper. It has a huge citation uh, ranking. Um, and the bottom line conclusion from this um, paper was what we see here that it supports Thomas Ellis' cultural intelligence hypothesis that there's no big difference between human and non-human causal cognition, but there's a really big difference between human and non-human social cognition. Okay. This is the graph that they showed to prove their point, which was replicated in every major newspaper. You have a graph here on the left of the physical domain in which it looks like the humans and the chimpanzees are pretty much the same. And the graph on the right-hand side, which is, shows that the humans are doing much better in the social domain. And, and just 
to reiterate, these humans here are preschoolers. They're two to three-year-olds. And these are adult chimpanzees and adult orangutans. That sold a lot of copy, all right? Let's look at the data section, though, which didn't get put up in the New York Times or anybody else's newspaper. In the data section, when you look at actually what was report, what they actually saw as a result, go to the causality domain. It turns out that on every one of their tests, except for the tool use test, the human little preschoolers actually outperformed both the chimps and the orangutans. The only reason that they could claim that there was no statistically, statistically significant difference is because if you add in this tool use one, it drops the whole average down and it makes it look like it's all the same. You take this thing out and it turns out that the human preschoolers outperformed the chimps and the orangutans on both the physical domain and the social domain. So let's ask, well, why did they do so badly on this? What was this tool use task? The tool use task was using a long stick to retrieve a reward that was out of reach. Now, what's the one kind of tool use that chimpanzees are the ex world experts on? Using sticks to retrieve out of reach food. And these are adult chimps that have done this their whole life. Against preschoolers, they have never tried to get a banana by using a stick to get a banana, right? And that doesn't stop there. They gave the chimps two minutes to get the food. They gave the preschoolers one minute. They didn't report that in any of the front page articles, did they? So it was a rigged Olympics, right? What this, what this results really suggest is that even when our children are only two years old, even when they can, I have a two-year-old at home, he can't get a spoonful of Cheerios to his mouth without spilling half of them in his, in his, in his lap. Right, he can't jump up and down without falling over backwards. These are against adult chimps. Even at two years old, our species children outperform children and orangutans on every test of causality except for using a big stick to get a banana. All right, so it turns out that on the very last page of their article, penultimate paragraph, they inserted this caveat, which I'll read to you. We should note that because the children were somewhat more skillful than the apes in the causality task, not involving active tool manipulation as well as in the task of social cognition, it is possible that what is distinctively human is not social cultural cognition as a specialized domain as we have hypothesized. Rather, what may be distinctive is the ability to understand unobserved causal forces in general, including as a special case, the mental states of others. So in fact, they do admit in print that their, our explanation is completely valid for their results. They just didn't put that in the abstract or the first paragraph or in the New York Times article about the, the entire result. So that leads to my tendentious claim number two. Tendentious claim number one was Darwin's. This is mine. That the gap between human and non-human causal cognition is at least as momentous as the gap between human and non-human social cognition. Second section of the talk. So why? Why does human causal cognition stick out like this? Why are we so weird in our way of reasoning about the physical world? Well, probably the most high popular hypothesis over the last few hundred years has been language. Uh, language is clearly something that is quite unique. Grammatically structured language is clearly unique to the human species. There have been a number of books that have made a very strong case for why language is what really makes the human mind stand out in every domain, social and, and causal. I've picked my favorite ones. I think all these books are terrific. If you haven't read any of them, I highly recommend them. So there is a very strong case to be made, of course, that language is instrumental in just about everything that human beings do. And there's not a single example of sophisticated tool use on that screen right now that would have been possible without language. So I am not challenging that language is essential and instrumental for human technology and culture. So please no one ask at the end, don't you think language is important? Yes, of course it's important. But the question is, is that the only thing? Is that the fundamental thing? Is that, is that enough to get you to being a human? That is, there is a myth, I think, in comparative psychology that if you spend enough time teaching a chimp language, you'll suddenly start thinking like a human being. Is that true? Well, we've learned one thing very important from the ape language experiments. We've learned they don't learn to act like human beings. That's a pretty important, pretty important conclusion. What we've learned is that you can train a, a chimp to use symbols, sign language, anything you want, as long as you want. They don't start using tools in anywhere near the way a sophisticated preschooler would do so. Uh, human minds, also a few other points if you want, if, uh, why the human mind can't be simply about language. We know that human minds are unique and they do all the things that human beings do, even if that person has no language at all. And we also know that children are little scientists long before they have words for saying anything like gravity or weight, or momentum. So those, those, those reasons alone, I think, would suggest that language can't possibly be the entire story, although it's certainly part of the story. We also know from the archaeology and, and uh, literature that there's good evidence that humans started to do fancy things with, with tools long before there's any compelling evidence of some kind of sophisticated language. Now, I'm very well aware of the fact that it's very difficult to get archaeological evidence of language. 
But nevertheless, this is suggestive again that tool use started, sophisticated human tool use started long before sophisticated human language did. And in the recent cap last couple of years, there have been a couple of papers in BBS that I just thought were terrific, uh, on, uh, which I think of as the post Chomskyan era of language uh, research. One was by Morton Christensen called Language is Shaped by the Brain. His hypothesis, in a, in a nutshell, is that when you look at the way language has been formed and the way it evolved, what really happened is that language evolved around the limitations and idiosyncrasies and possibilities of the human brain, not the other way around. It's a very simple idea that I think is very, very powerful. I'm not going to summarize this whole paper. Please read it if you haven't read this paper. And, and, and Evans and Levinson have a paper on the myth of language universals, which really deconstructs the entire uh, Chomskyan paradigm, which you believe that there's some really deep fundamentals in language that really drive everything. Now, why that's relevant to my conversation today is if those two papers, and I believe they are, are correct, or at least headed in the right direction, then that really suggests that what is going on in human language is not something that's just specialized for human language. Both of them make the point that what you need as a brain in order to do human language is a very complex of higher order relational kinds of operations. Right? Those same kind of operations that have probably been used for other things prior to language. Right? So once again, Darwin was right, I believe. He said, a long time ago, a long time before linguistics and Chomsky and everybody else, the mental powers of some early progenitor of man must have been more highly developed than in any existing day before even the most imperfect form of speech could have come into use. I believe he's right, but you probably can realize there's a lot of people out there in comparative psychology that believe he must be wrong because they believe, in fact, that an ape could, in fact, learn language. So if it's not language, let's take the probably more popular hypothesis now, and also I think the stronger hypothesis, is a human culture that makes us unique. Again. There's been a bunch of books out there that have done this. I put the ones I think that are great. Uh, if you haven't read any of these, uh, I'm not getting an Amazon kickback, by the way, for suggesting books. Mm -hmm. This is just a, a, altruism. Um, I think these are all terrific, and I think they're absolutely right about the importance of ontogeny, the importance of cultural ratchet effect, uh, the importance of, of, of culture in general for human beings. So I'm not challenging that at all. I'm not challenging the fact that culture is essential and exceptional and that we wouldn't have done any of these things without human culture. What I'm asking is a different question. Is culture it? Is that the only thing? Is that the bottom, is that the bottom fundamental difference between human and non-human culture? I think one challenge to that is that we do know that animals do have cultures. Now, we have to use scare quotes a little bit. It's not clear how deep those go. It's not, it's not clear how long they last. There's a lot of fuzziness about that. But we do know that there are variations, population-based variations among uh, animal species. So I think the really interesting question with human culture is not, uh, not why do we have culture at all, but why is it cumulative? That's certainly the, that's when the aspect of human culture that clearly stands out relative to all of our non-human uh, cousins. I don't think the answer can be that chimpanzees can't learn from each other. That used to be an answer that you would hear a lot. Uh, because some early experiments suggested that chimpanzees were only what they called emulating, they weren't copying. There's been a lot of work since then, and I think if you look at all that work, there's no qualitative block there that's stopping a chimp from learning from each other and from a human demonstrator. There's been a lot of experiments showing that they both copy and they emulate. Depends on the, the conditions and depends on the, the task. Uh, this, was, this little picture here is from, uh, from Andrew Witten's uh, artificial fruit box in which the chimps, different groups of chimps would, would observe different ways of getting, of opening this locked box. And there's a lot of Witten stuff here that if you haven't read it, really I think makes a strong case that chimpanzees do copy and learn from each other. So that can't be the only explanation for why we have cumulative culture and they don't. Witten has, I think, an interesting idea, um, which he came up with, I think it was a 2008 paper. My citations are coming up slightly down this, off the screen. Um, he noticed that across a lot of these different kind of experiments, what you'd find is that the chimpanzees would tend to learn and, and latch on to the first technique they learned. And even if you then showed them a better technique that was more effective, but was maybe slightly more complicated, they wouldn't go on to try to use that technique. They sort of get stuck. Right? They get stuck doing whatever they learned the first time. So the problem is not that they can't learn from others. The problem is that once they've learned how to do it, they don't really see the point of going on and learning some more sophisticated technique. I think that's an interesting hypothesis. I think, I think it points to perhaps an interesting uh, limitation in the way uh, chimpanzees are reasoning about the problems they're solving. And I think it goes to this point, which is that we know that teaching is unique. Human teachers truly are unique, and there's nothing like human teaching in the non-human world. But to say that teaching is the reason that human culture is unique is only half of the puzzle. You need students to have teaching. You can't just have teachers. And I think you can look at the case of all the uh, great apes, chimps and bonobos in particular, that have been raised from childhood in human hands by very doting, very uh, the most overspoiled kids ever, right? You certainly, this is Kanzi, by the way, if you don't recognize him. Um, 
you certainly cannot say that Kanzi has suffered from a lack of attention or a lack of teaching or a lack of instruction or even a lack of love or a lack of anything like that. But what is remarkable about all these experiments with apes that have been growing up with uh, human beings is that even if you have the most dedicated human teachers, they just don't learn what human children learn. It doesn't matter what you do with them. It doesn't matter how you teach them. So the teaching equation has two parts, the teacher and the student. It's true that non-human animals don't have teachers. They also don't have students in the way that we have human students. These pictures here are from a famous experiment that was done with Kanzi and, and stone flaking. So they're trying to teach Kanzi how to flake stones the way uh, purportedly our, 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 our ancestors did. Uh, and they spent a lot of time doing this. And the interesting thing is that Kanzi uh, tried to flake the two. He got very frustrated with it. And he threw the stone down across the cage. And it broke into a bunch of pieces. And he used one of the pieces to actually get his food. This is a good example of both how animals like Kanzi can be very clever how they can solve problems in, in, in creative ways, and also how they don't, he, Kanzi didn't understand the point. Why should I put the extra effort in to get a, a sharp blade in a certain pattern that's going to be reliable and I can keep on having the same way? He didn't see the point. For him, if I can have a shortcut that just gets me the food now, that's all I'm going to do. And that sort of lends support to Witten's idea that there's something about the way chimpanzees learn that's getting them stuck without going farther and looking for more complicated solutions. So I would ask you this. Where would we be, where would human culture be if we didn't have the ability to reason diagnostically, if we didn't have the, reason, the ability to reason about unobservable causal forces like weight and force, if we didn't have the ability to see functional similarities among disparate examples, and if we didn't have any curiosity. Now they have instrumental curiosity, curiosity in the sense of I want to get something to figure out how, but they don't have any evidence of epistemic curiosity, of trying to figure out how the world works. Where would human culture be if we didn't have any of those things? My tendentious claim is that it wouldn't be very far, and therefore, Human culture would not be possible without human causal cognition. OK, last section. So how did this multifarious gap evolve? Because in fact, there's not one gap. We, we've got these differences between human and non-human cognition across lots of different domains. It's not just causal cognition, obviously. I've, I've not talked about the other stuff, but clearly our social cognition is radically different. Our language is different. Our navigation systems are different. There's so many different aspects of human cognition that are different than the animals. You've got to ask yourself on Darwinian grounds, how is this possible? How is it that one species and no other evolved all these different cognitive abilities? Well, one, one answer, which might be called the classically Darwinian answer, is that it's all massively modular uh, architecture. Because each one of our abilities is sort of like a, a, a beak or on a finch, right? We've, we've evolved an ability of specialization for social cognition. We've, ability, we've evolved a specialization for causal cognition. Each one of these things rests in more or less its own little silo. There are, in fact, people that actually hold this very strong, uh, massively modular uh, explanation for human cognition. I don't have a knockdown argument about why that has to be false, but it doesn't strike me as being all that plausible. So I think we should be motivated for looking for some solution where there's more overlap. Because wouldn't we expect evolution to work that way? Wouldn't we, we, wouldn't we expect there to be more dependencies between these silos? So otherwise, we're going to really have to call this the massively lucky hypothesis, because suddenly we have independent uh, genomic effects that produce each one of these things independently. Doesn't seem plausible. It seems to me the picture is going to be a mess. It's going to look something like this. It's going to be a bunch of different things in our ecological and evolutionary background that are all impinging on us at the same time. And that there's going to be a tremendous degree of overlap between the cognitive mechanisms involved in language, practical reasons, social cognition, causal cognition, et cetera, et cetera. So it feels to me like the really interesting question, the question that we should all be looking for, is, OK, what's in the middle there? Where are the things in the middle? It's not just one thing. What are the things, what are the computational mechanisms, the cognitive mechanisms that are driving and enabling all these other different aspects of human cognition that are so unique? That would give us a more practical, a plausible explanation for why we are so different. Because if we could identify that, they would make sense that we're the only ones that have theory of mind, and we're the only ones that have diagnostic causal reasoning, and we're the only ones that have language. So what could that be? Here I'm going to step out into a speculative hypothesis. I'm going to start by giving you a test. Everyone look at this quickly and figure out which one of the choices down there belongs in the empty blank. Pretty easy, right? Do this one. Not too hard, right? And this one I'm just going to skip over because it could take too much time. So what is that all? Those are all little tasks from a test called Raven's uh, Progressive Matrices, Raven's Standard Matrices. It's a, a very well-established uh, test for of IQ, essentially. 
And it's pretty, pretty much the best test we have for measuring fluid intelligence or nonverbal fluid intelligence in human beings. And grossly speaking, you can rank these tasks by their relational complexity. It's the number of relations that are involved in the task. So the first one I showed you is basically zero relations. It's a match to sample task. Right? All you need to do to solve that is find the sample that matches the, the, the target. That's it. Okay? Uh, a one relation, you have one operation to look for. And then two relations, you have two transformations at the same time to look for, et cetera. It goes three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, it gets harder and harder for us to process as human beings as the number of relations go up. Right? Um, and then we start differing quite radically amongst each other as you get up to many, many relations. But all normal human beings by about your know, kindergarten age are solving these two relation problems and analogies, which are, if you will, real world examples of two relation problems. So if you think of a problem like B is to, to a hive as spider is to what, that's a higher order relation. There's two relations involved. It just happens to have in, uh, require domain world knowledge. So you can all guess that you know, this is sort of a pure thing. It doesn't require any domain knowledge. So you're going to have, uh, you're going to learn this stuff later, right? Because you have to need to know something about bees before you can solve the, uh, the two relational problem. So I think it's a very interesting question to ask, OK, where would animals rank in this? Uh, I don't want to put it coarsely like what's an animal's IQ, but how, what, which one of these tests could they pass and which would, would they not pass? Well, it turns out that just about every species on the planet, down to honeybees, can pass the zero relation master sample test. So that's just sort of like entry ticket for getting in the, the, the ball game of being an animal, right? You get to this task, one relations, and it gets fuzzy. There is some claims uh, in the literature for the last quarter century or so that they pass a kind of task called the relational match to sample task. That is, you have you know, a, a pair of apples, and your choices are between a pair of oranges or a, a, a watermelon and a, an avocado. And so they're supposed to say, well, the relation between the two apples is the same as the relation between the two oranges. Therefore, I'll choose that. That is, in some sense, a, a second order or a, a two relation uh, task. Um, but it's not really, when you, when you look at how animals solve those tasks, it turns out that you can get the animals to solve that, even monkeys and pigeons, if you give them enough trials. But what they're solving is not the relation, they're solving the, vari the, the, visual, dis the visual variability in the display. And Ed Wasserman, I think, did a wonderful job of showing this. It turns out that as you, as you add more and more objects to the sample, it gets easier and easier for animals to solve. Which doesn't make sense from a logical or relational point of view, but it makes perfect sense if all you're really looking at as an animal is the perceptual variability in the displays. So this is a little bit up for grabs. We're not really quite sure. We've got nobody solving real two relation problems, and there's absolutely no evidence of analogical reasoning. If any of you have read the one paper on analogical reasoning by Sarah and want to question me afterwards about that, I'll jump on the occasion to answer why that's not a very good, good test. But for right now, let's just stipulate there is no evidence in the animal kingdom of two relations or analogies or higher order relations, and there's spotty evidence for a generalized uh, one relation problem. So then let's ask ourselves, what would human cognition look like if we didn't have the ability to reason about higher order relations at all, if we were like the animals? Well, it's pretty obvious that language, and our numbering system, and mathematics are all fundamentally based on higher order relationships. So we wouldn't have language and we wouldn't have numbers. It seems pretty plausible, we don't know for sure, that theory of mind operations feel a lot like second order problems. They are analogies. We, we always talk about, uh, I understand your thoughts or feelings by analogy to my own. And we, we do know that, that human beings that have deficits in second order relational reasoning have deficits in theory of mind. So there's also some suggestive evidence that the ontogeny is similar, that the, the computational operations are similar. So I think it's a plausible hypothesis to argue that if we didn't have higher order reasoning as an ability, we wouldn't have a theory of mind. We wouldn't have the ability to think about other people's mental states. We wouldn't have joint attention. We wouldn't have any of the things that this is a Tomasello's picture. We wouldn't have any of the things that Michael Tomasello argues is necessary for culture. And I think he's right that we need all those things. And by the way, I forgot to mention, Tomasello also admitted a long time ago when he was a linguist, that we would need analogies to have language. But he doesn't mention that anymore. And we, we need analogies in higher order relationships to understand the world. This is how we understand very, very abstract things, like the, the atom is sort of like a planetary system. But it's also, as I think we saw in earlier examples, how we understand much more mundane things, like why do things fall? And how do things balance? And all those, all those principles that come so naturally to preschooler human beings on up, we solve those things by thinking them in terms of the higher order relationships between different problems. And we don't get stuck on just the perceptual features of one particular task. There is also very strong evidence, I believe, at the physical level, at the neural level, if you will, that there's a part of the human brain that's responsible for higher order relational reasoning. It's located right up front, exactly where you would think it would be on good Darwinian grounds. If it was something that's tacked on late in our evolution, we were able to add this special ability to human beings, where would you expect it to be? Not down in the middle, right? So we got 
it's exactly where you'd expect it to be. It's enormously expanded in human beings relative to the other great apes. We have pretty good evidence from the imaging uh, folks that this is where the crucial operations and higher order relations are, are being processed. So there's good support from the neural literature. And they happen, they happen to be big fans of this hypothesis, by the way. So this, the neural folks think this makes a lot of sense, that this is the thing that's allowing us to, to reason differently than the others. And there's just a general trend, if you will, in the psychology literature um, towards what is broadly called dual process account. Now, there's some kinds of dual process accounts I don't agree with. That is, there's some kind of dual process accounts that, that hypothesize that animals are limited to associative learning and that humans have everything else. I don't think that's the right way to draw the line. I think the right place to draw the line is that animals are capable of compositional and productive relational reasoning, but they're stuck at a first order level, at first order relations. They're not doing the higher order relations. And these folks here are happening to go down that same path. So um, I think there's very good evidence in the case of human beings that we have two systems for doing social or theory of mind tasks, one that's automatic and is much like what the animals are doing, and one, one that requires higher order relational reasoning. So in sum, my hypothesis, which we've called the relational reinterpretation hypothesis, is that the great bulk of human cognition is j pretty much just like the animals. And by the way, it's not associative, it's compositional, productive, and, and, and relational. So I'm good, I think Darwin would be very happy with that picture. This is exactly what he would expect. And the hypothesis is simply that we have a little thing on top, actually in front, that is allowing us to reason about higher order relations across all these different domains. So here's my four tendentious claims for, the, for, for this talk. The one, the beginning one, Darwin's, is that the gap between human and non-human minds is enormous and not the result of culture or language alone. My second claim is that the gap between human and non-human co causal cognition is at least as large as the gap between human and non-human social cognition. My third claim is that human culture would not be possible without human causal cognition. And my fourth, and, and most speculative, of course, is that our ability to reason about higher order relationships subserves a wide variety of distinctively human um, capabilities. I have five falsifiable predictions to leave you with, uh, which were actually all in a, a BBS paper I wrote a few years ago, and we proposed 16, actually more than that, 24 experiments for people to go out and prove us wrong. Um, one, that no animal will ever pass a task of second order higher, higher order relational reasoning test, that no animal will ever pass an analogical reasoning test, that no human incapable of passing second order relational task will pass a robust false belief task. Again, that's still consistent with everything we know so far that humans with deficits in higher order relational reasoning will exhibit deficits in higher order causal cognition. We haven't tested that yet. That should be tested. I hope somebody here might run out and do it. And that the ontogeny of social linguistic and causal cognition is strongly dependent on the ontogeny of higher order relational reasoning. And there's lots of good correlational or statistical evidence that this is true, but not the kind of knockdown, down drag out evidence I would love to have that would really cement this hypothesis. So I leave you five open questions. Is there a single or multiple neural systems in the brain that are responsible for this? There's, a, there's an interesting debate among the neural folks about whether the medial and lateral sections or regions of the, of the prefrontal cortex are, have distinct roles. Uh, is the medial role distinctly responsible for theory of mind and the lateral side is distinctly responsible for more abstract, non-social? Or is in fact, is, are they both, is the lateral uh, uh, sort of underneath and subserving some of the computations going on in the medial? That's an open question. Uh, that's still certainly a live uh, experimental topic. How, how exactly does the brain implement a higher order relational operations? I, I should admit right up right front, my, my personal belief right now is that we don't have a clue how we do this. That the various computational connectionist, symbol, symbolic connectionist efforts to model how a brain might do this have largely bottomed out at toy models that aren't even close to having the same relational intelligence of an iguana, let alone a preschooler. So there's a huge unanswered question here for any of us that are interested in understanding human psychology at a cognitive level, that is actually having a model, that is we have no model for how relational reasoning can be implemented in a biologically plausible fashion in a brain. And I'm not talking about human levels, I'm talking about iguana levels. So that's a big open question. I would love to know which high order process came first. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg question, but I think it's an interesting one to speculate about. It's always fun to speculate about that. I don't think anything hinges on it, but it's interesting. And I'd love to know why high order relational reasoning is so costly in this adaptive landscape, the search space of, of cognition, why did only one species fall in this? But I suspect we're not gonna know the answer to number five until we have the answer to number three, which is why I think it's so important that someone runs out and figures out how to do number three. And I think that's it. That's all. <laughs>